I am very excited to be here and to talk about a topic that I have not really spoken about before. Uh, and I find it a little bit difficult because I'm, this is like trying to translate how the world works inside my mind, which is obviously the objective truth, uh, <laughs> to like words that other people can, can also engage with. And very often, if you've heard me speak before, I have slides with very many words on them and then I speak super fast. Uh, and this talk is not going to be like that. I'm still going to talk super fast, uh, but I'm going to think aloud a fair amount. And I'm terrified, but you're nice, so you're going to support me. So it's going to go great. Yes. My I, 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 it's called something else in the program, but I tried to translate. What is it that I'm really talking about? And it's getting smart about changing the world. So what we're all talking about here in some way, that's why we're at this conference, is that we want to use the LARP to make an impact on reality in some way. And that can be very different ways, as we've heard. Uh, and I would like for us to, to follow up in many ways on what, what Eric was talking about yesterday and just zoom out and think about like, what does that actually entail. So something that already a lot of people have been talking about is this idea of reach. Like how may you make a LARP or you make any kind of activism or you make any kind of art or you make any kind of action in the world that will affect other people and it will affect them a lot or a little, it will affect many people or few people. And we can think about reach in terms of primary reach, secondary reach and perhaps systemic reach. I don't know what that's, if that's what it's called, I just pulled it out of my ass. But but primary reach would be, I make a thing and some people directly engage with that thing. I make a LARP, some people come and play my LARP. Now, we know that that actually has, there's, <laughs> that already is a pretty limited number because LARP as an art form is something that you typically have to do in the room. Of course, there are edge cases like online LARPing and so on, but basically you have to physically put some people together in a room and the design will be able to handle a certain number of characters or, or, play, or players uh, and it will take some, sp some specific time and you need to like, have them in a place and that sets a hard limit on how many people we can engage with a piece. And of course if you make a, a very complicated LARP and you only run it once, then th there will be a hard limit on how many people you, you directly reach. Then we are, as, a, as the LARP community has been, has been um, investing in this over years to try and solve this problem, like I made a really good LARP, I want it to affect more people, what do I do? Well, you can rerun it, or you can package it in a way so that other people can rerun it. But of course, there's still quite a lot of effort, especially if it's a big LARP, to a, a, a big production, and maybe you can only run it once a year or twice a year or three times a year, and maybe you reach 100 people every time, but suddenly you have invested quite a lot of hours into reaching maybe 300 people, 300 persons a year. I'm not saying it's not worth it, clearly it's worth it, that's why we're here. Right? Another solution is to say maybe we can make LARPs that are shorter, lower threshold, easier to rerun, we can make small, smaller LARPs, we can make black box games that can travel very easily, we can have a PDF, people can download them and run them in other places. I don't need to physically be there, that's already very helpful. And we know that this also, this actually works. There are many Nordic type or international LARPs published in PDFs uh, or in the like, books like LARP from, LARPs from the Factory that we know for a fact have been played thousands of times in the world. So then already we are looking at numbers like, okay, there are LARPs that have reached 4,000 or 10,000 or 50,000 perhaps people in their homes or in their schools or at their universities. And that's not trivial. But of course, on the, on the scale of really changing the world, the question is how much can we, how much can I affect somebody with four hours in their room and I'm not even there to, to, to check that they have understood what the LARP is trying to do. And that's still kind of limited, right? So that's, that's a fundamental, just, that's just a fact of, of how this art form works, and that's a limitation, and that's part of what I'm going to try and talk about, that, that depending on what we're trying to achieve, we have to think about the strategic effort that we put in. And never ever, even when I say maybe LARP is not the best tool, which I will say many times during this presentation, I don't mean LARP is not great. LARP is the best thing, and I have committed my whole life to LARP and making LARP better. Like, that's my baseline. But LARP is very good for some things and less good for some other things. And then there are some other ways that we might think about that that can offer new ways of using LARP. And I think that's what this, these whole days are about. Secondary reach would be things like other people hearing about the LARP or talking about the LARP or thinking about the LARP 
being there could be things like your <coughs> colleagues or your family members, and you tell them all the stories about the lark. <laughs> and that might be a positive thing, and they might think, wow, that was amazing, or it might be a negative thing, uh, depending on how good a storyteller you are and how much bleed you have. Um, <laughs> It could also be things like media coverage. You make a LARP about a thing. Uh, you make a LARP about refugees uh, th this year in Italy or in, in the United Kingdom. And the mainstream media write about it. In the UK, perhaps, you make the quota. And The Guardian or then the BBC will, will create very good content talking about this piece. And you are using the idea, the weirdness, or the special occasion of the LARP to create a news moment. So something that is ongoing, like the refugee situation in the world, the migrant crisis, um, is very difficult to keep in the news, because news always has to be about something that happens at a specific time. So if you have an ongoing process, lifting something into the news, you need some kind of excuse to do that. And a LARP is one way of, of doing it. A demonstration could be another one. You, you create something that happens at a specific time, so news organizations can look at it and say, today we think about the migrant crisis, because look, these people are playing a LARP. Of course, secondary reach can also take other forms. In Italy, for instance, far-right media attacked the LARP makers and there were death threats and, and so on. And then there were some fights about, about that. You can't always control the narrative. The kinds of stories that are being told about your LARP may or may not support some goals that you have. And sometimes you just make a LARP that isn't intended to change the world at all and other people find out about it. There is what we call context collapse which is when the, something is reported on the internet and people who don't know what LARP is or they don't understand your LARP culture, or they don't understand your culture, they misunderstand something and then there's a big crisis and a fight. And then suddenly you already made a LARP, you've already invested perhaps thousands of hours. Now you also have to take the next thousands of hours and handle some kind of shitstorm on the internet. That can also happen. That's also a kind of secondary reach. So secondary reach has some potential but it also has a price, so sometimes it's like I don't even want anybody to know. Like The more interesting my LARP is, maybe I don't want to tell any, anybody about it because I just can't handle the consequences of people who don't, who don't understand what it is. But then, of course, I am, my reach becomes smaller. My piece is affecting less people. Typically, of course, when we make political, explicitly political LARPs or LARPs with some kind of agenda, we are very interested in the secondary reach. We want the journalists to be there. And often in LARP we say, oh, we want to embed you, you have to play. That's a, a very normal trade-off in LARP, that we say you can come and write about it, but then you also have to play. You have to witness the LARP from inside the LARP. I think this is a reasonable claim for a LARP maker. I'm also a journalist by, by, by trade. And it's not a simple thing for a news journalist in particular, because the moment you put yourself inside a piece, you're like compromised. You can't write about it neutrally anymore. So this is difficult. LARP works pretty well on the culture pages, and it works pretty poorly in the news sections. And also, historically, we've had this. Stories about LARP have often been, look, people are doing interesting things, which is not quite the same as, hello, this is a nuance, this discussion of the situation in Palestine, you know, which is the message you want. It's like, they are wearing costumes, pretending to be other people. Like, then that becomes the story, and that's not a very useful story for whatever goal you're trying to achieve. But arguably, there are some other kinds of impact of LARP and on the so-called systems level, and I'm going to return to that in a little while. So but just if we talk about the individual impact first, we have this idea in the community that is based on our own experiences as players that, that we can really change individuals or affect individuals very deeply by playing LARPs. And I think perhaps, I mean, and I, mean I feel that to be true, but the fact is that even with 20, 25 years of LARP theory, or 25 years, 20 years of LARP theory, basically, we don't know almost anything about the player experience. We have been so focused on design, and I think we should have been, like, I think that was a reasonable progression, that we haven't actually spent a lot of time thinking about what is role playing. Like, what is, that's why Hilda's presentation was so important. And like, that's going to be, the next five years of LARP theory are going to be about what the heck is happening inside the players. Like, what are players actually doing when they LARP? How do they interact with the design and so on? And that's a lot of exciting work is just starting there. That's going to be super interesting. But right now, we don't actually know. So we don't know how much does LARP actually affect the players. But we have the intuitive experience and we have the lived experience that placing yourself inside these stories and placing yourself inside characters and interacting with narratives through the characters can affect us very deeply and make us emotionally invested 
in a situation or in a power dynamic that also exists in the real world. And we also know that we can take that with us. We can take that investment with us. And after playing a LARP, I will uh, think differently or notice differently, for instance, in the media, stories about HIV AIDS or um, the death penalty or uh, the political situation in Palestine, for instance. So clearly there is some kind of effect. But exactly how it works, we don't quite know. And I think it's possible, it's worth thinking about at least, that when you come out of especially like a big multi-day LARP and you're very emotionally like this, uh, which is the best and which is the reason many of us play, we go and hunt those extreme experiences uh, because it's very satisfying to go on those emotional journeys. We want it to be very important. I want my experience to mean something and I want, so I say to myself, I have now been changed by this experience. Maybe I have, maybe I haven't. Maybe that translates to something for the rest of my life. Maybe I just had a really powerful art experience and it didn't change me very much more than crying at the opera or reading a novel changed. So I think we have to be a little bit honest with ourselves and say, possibly we are like certain types of, of effects LARPs have on the players, but maybe not quite as much as we like to think, right? Maybe the impact isn't as life-changing as we want it to be, because typically, of course, players who play political LARPs, for instance, are already interested in the questions. They can become reactivated or more invested in something that they were already interested in, and now they understand it more deeply or they feel more deeply, and maybe that uh, makes them activists. People who are interested now become activists. That's a very good change. Like, that's a powerful change. But maybe it's not quite the same as changing the world, especially since we reach so few individuals. Stories on the secondary reach level, things like your family members and the media, is basically we are telling stories about impacts and experiences that, that have happened to other people, to us. And I think that that's not very powerful. When it comes to like just changing the world, I think that if I read in the newspaper about some, some project that has happened or some lab has, that has been played, I will think, oh, that's interesting. And that might remind me of something that's happening in the real world, but I don't think that will actually change me. I will read the article and I will say, those people probably had an amazing experience, or wow, I understand that these people were really changed, but that's not quite the same as thinking I will be changed. If, if I want to have an effect through a newspaper article about the migrant crisis, telling stories about migrants is probably a much better tool. Then I am engaging with some, with some real people's real experiences instead of like, oh, some people thought about a thing. So now I will think about people thinking about a thing. You see, the, so even if you get a lot of, of reach in the secondary sphere, the best case scenario maybe is that the, you get a lot of reach and then people are like, I also want to play that, I also want to think about this, and maybe I will un download the PDF and play it. And then that has had some effect, but actually on the political issue itself or the real world issue, it's probably not very, uh, very meaningful. But, for instance, in Finland, where uh, I'm also constantly I'm using Halat Hisar, which is a Palestinian Finnish project about uh, the situation in Palestine, the, the occupation of Palestine. Every time the words occupation of Palestine are in the newspapers in Finland, it's a win. You know, like then already, like, if, whenever you achieve that goal, you have achieved something that is really real and tangible because people forget all the time that this is happening. So again, it's not zero, but that is not the same. Keeping people aware of the fact that something is happening in the world is not the, the same as activating them to change it in some way. Okay, and then on the third level, we probably have things like LARP makes, LARP affects LARPers. Playing LARPs, and in particular designing LARPs, but I think that already playing LARPs has this effect, it changes how you engage with the world. And here also there's some fallacy, because it's possible, it's even likely, that people who are already systems thinkers or systems enjoyers enjoy like LARP more than other people like LARP. Some people LARP, and for them it's like a very... Um, aesthetic experience or it's just like playing like any other kind of playing with some kind of game and they are not deeply affected it's possible that there's something about people who like LARP that is different from people who don't like LARP even if you give them the exact same experience we don't know that but it would seem that people like us people in this room and the people for whom we make LARPs and who keep LARPing are or become systems thinkers world builders culture designers, norm hackers. When you play LARPs, it becomes very clear to you that everything in the world, all human behavior, all human culture is constructed out of rules and limitations and all human interaction is meta techniques. And 
you know, so we can we start to see in the 90s we would have called this a hacker mindset. But you start looking at the world and you see, oh, hang on, like things that happen in the world are controlled by rules, and the rules are different in different countries, and they're different in different social environments, and they're different in different situations, and we play roles that are different in different situations, and we have different agency in different roles. And when you start to look at the world like this, you understand if you are a game designer, oh, hang on, that means this can be changed. If the world sucks, or if people are unhappy, or if there is oppression, or if in certain social roles I am not allowed to do certain things but a person who is a man, or a person who is older, or a person who is younger, has more agency, these dynamics are something that we can program. And just like we do that in game design, of course we can do that in reality. So ultimately, it seems likely that the biggest impact of LARP, the biggest impact of LARP design, and the biggest impact of LARP communities is that we are training everybody who comes in contact with this art form in systems thinking, it is in changing the world, in programming how reality works and what power and agency is available to the humans in the world. And this, of course, is massive. This is very awesome. This is so cool. And this is, by the way, why the Norwegian Foreign Office is funding the LARP Writer Summer School, or was funding the LARP Writer Summer School. It, that was not a cultural project. That was a diplomatic project because the Norwegian Foreign Office made the analysis, which is completely correct in my view, that understanding LARP design means understanding how democracy is supposed to work and how cultures change. This is so awesome, but it's also very slow. Because you are literally training people to engage in a different way with the world. We're changing people for life, slowly. Over years of engaging with LARP design, you become very adept at also programming the world around you. I hope in good ways. Of course, you can use the exact same tools for manipulation. People in advertising, for instance, are often very good experienced designers, but they use it for very different purposes than we do. Okay. Uh, and this also means that no, the individual LARP that you make is relatively unimportant. It's just the continuing existence of LARPs that is very important. Now, let's think about how power works in the world. Like, what does it mean to, to make a change in the world? What would, what would that actually entail? Who controls how reality works? And I've put some things up here, so already we have some cheap answers here. Uh, the real answers, and I realize you can't see it at all in this room, I'm sorry. The real answers, more or less, is in those three bubbles up there. You could draw this up in many ways. This was just like I just drew down what was on the top of my head. The first bubble says people. The second bubble says government, and the third bubble says capital. There are more bubbles, but like, let's start by thinking about this. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, I think this is, this is enough. Who decides in the world? Who controls how stuff works? Like, if I ask you, if I were to ask you that question, what would be your first answer? The Illuminati. <laughs> the Illuminati. Yes, no, uh, we, we believe that not to be the case, but actually that's an interesting, like we could have a whole conversation about why do people want conspiracy theories to be real? Like that has to do with how the structures work, but I'm gonna try not to talk about that today. <laughs> so for instance, some people would say, oh, the government decides, or the dictator in my country decides, or this political party in the pretended democracy that is my country is actually running things. And is that, I mean, Sweden doesn't have a government right now, or it has a kind of dead lame duck government, but basically there's no government in Sweden and things are chugging along just fine. Who is deciding things in Sweden just now? Status quo. Status quo, yeah, people are like continuing, sort of. So the political parties, the leaders of the political parties and their goodwill would be, is, is continuing, is, con is, is letting things continue and, and letting the country be governed in Sweden. Um, when a government makes a decision, who actually writes what's on the page? Is it the members of the government? No. no. So that would be people who work in the ministries, bureaucrats, policy makers of different kinds. Some of those, most of those are not elected. These are individual. The, all of these people are humans, right? There are humans in different rooms talking to each other in institutional structures, and that's how they control what's happening. Government is super important because government controls two massively big controlled mechanisms in the world, political, the, the uh, public spending and law. Public spending is everything that the state, a state or a public uh, body like a region or a municipality puts money into, like education or arts funding or a bunch of other things. 
events like this, perhaps. I don't know how we're funded, uh, funded this time. And government, of course, makes the laws. And the laws control quite a lot about how people behave. Now, how, if I wanted to make a law, how would I go about that? If I want to change a law, if the thing I want to change in the world is a law. Talk to your local legislator. I talk to my local legislator, yes. So that means probably I would talk to my member of parliament. How, uh, how much power does my one member of parliament have on the law? Very little. So how do, we, how do laws get changed? You need, <laughs> yes? In my country, we talk to people. And people, if they are enough, then they can raise new laws. The people, Switzerland. Switzerland, yes. Aha, uh -huh. more direct, director democracy. Interesting, <laughs> yes. So then you need to organize the people in a direct way. Yeah. In a lot of other countries, you need to do it in an indirect way. You need very many politicians to agree that a, a law needs to happen. Not super many, but just enough. There doesn't even need to be a majority, but you need enough politicians to agree that change needs to happen <coughs> so that they are invested in trading something else for other politicians so that that thing will happen. Okay, how do I make enough politicians agree on a thing. If they, today they are not thinking about it, or today they think the law is fine, or today they're like, okay, it's important, but we're never gonna be able to change it. How do I convince a number of politicians? Yes? They need to believe that the voters care about the issue. Yes, they need to believe that the voters care about the issue. Media? Yeah. We use Facebook in our country, just if uh, uh, something is reposted really wide, it has more influence than people going on the streets. And yeah, so uh, Ella has the taught me... Politicians are afraid of somebody. Ella has taught me that, uh, that there's, uh, people have counted on this, and if you want to make a revolution, you need 10% of the population in the street. Another, yes? The number has gone down with online activism because it makes it easier to organize people. Great, the number and has gone down with online activism. Where no, are we no, now? No, I mean, the, the, um, or rather, uh, gone up. Like the, oh, gone up, that, yeah. That, that, that the Damn people it. in the street are an indicator of commitment. Yes. So, but anyway, like, and 10%, it sounds like a lot, 10% of the population, but we don't want to make a revolution. Remember Ella said in the keynote, don't make a revolution, that's a terrible <laughs> one, that always goes to shits. But yes, so you want to the politicians to understand that the, that the people really care about this thing, so, and you can do that through social media, it's one medium, and you can affect, reach politicians very good because you can reach the individual politician on their phone. We're seeing the dark side of this with Donald Trump, of course. Uh, also, the fact that now on Fox News, literally in the news, people are turning to the camera and saying, Mr. President, blah, 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 because they know he's watching. So they are literally just telling him things, and then it shows up on his Twitter feed like 10 minutes later. It's very strange. Uh, yes, social media. I wish I was joking, but I'm not. We are living in a dystopian society. Uh, so if we take something, so how do we get people to agree that something needs to change? Oops. Sorry? Something? Yeah? We show them that there is a problem. Yeah. So here's interesting. So, so the, it doesn't work in the way that first everybody in a population agrees that we need to change this thing and then the law is changed as a result. And it also doesn't change so that some very enlightened politicians change the law and then everybody changes their behavior. This happens in a sort of interchange. So what typically happens is that a group of people who are influential or very good at explaining their point become super invested in something and they get enough politicians on board. They explain why long term this is a smart strategy for this country, for instance, to do this thing. And then the law is made and then the law becomes that re it doesn't necessarily reflect the cultural values of the country all in all but it becomes normative, so the, the, the law helps shape the, the, the norms of the country. In most Nordic countries, for instance, it was not illegal to hit your children until the 1980s. So I remember a time when there were public campaigns aimed at children and at parents and at lawmakers saying, hey, don't hit your kids, because actually science tells us that that's a really bad idea. Also inhumane. Now it's unthinkable for a Nordic parent to hit their child. Of course you don't do that. But that is a very new cultural change. Similarly, when childcare was made, made available in the Nordic countries uh, for everyone, there was, there was some financial reasons for this. Like, so it was both like a feminist ag agenda. Women need to get out in the workplace. We are stuck to the home because these kids, there's no, there's no childcare. So we need good childcare so the women can also work. And it's a project of individual liberation for a lot of women. But also on the country level, it's really good. Like if you live in a country with small populations, like, like 4 million, 5 million, 6 million, 10 million, like in the Nordic countries, actually the more people you have in the workforce, it's better for the economy of the whole country. So it's a really good idea financially to have childcare 
to have public childcare so that women can go to work. So there are different interests who allied on this. But when, when, that was, when childcare was in introduced for all the citizens, this was a cutting edge idea. It wasn't like the majority of people in the country wanted this to happen. It was like enough people wanted it to happen. The politicians did the math. They realized that this is actually pretty smart or we can win some politics on this. And then they made the change. And then because that became the system or that became the law in the case of, of hitting children, then people are saying, well, it's the law. Clearly, it's a good idea, or like it's completely normal to put your children in childcare. Women should work. Like that's that's the system. Clearly, this is a normal thing to do. So, so changing the system, changing the laws, will also change people's norms and behaviors over time. All of this is so slow, of course. So, but there is a direct relationship between government and people, and it's complicated. Um, but the, but it's an interplay that exists in the world. But the important thing to remember here is, of course, that on every level of this. These are still humans interacting with each other. Then I made a box called Capital, and I just mean like commercial companies. And this is the one that's hardest for us to conceptualize, and I'm absolutely no expert in this. And the reason I'm no expert in this is that, that private capital does not want us to understand how this system works. But basically, the, the short information is that companies are bigger than states. Many companies are a lot bigger than states. And that there is relatively limited control that state, like states and, and capital are in a, in a, in a they are re relying on each other because, yes, we pay taxes, but the real money that a lot of states make is from the taxation of private capital, of, of companies, basically, businesses. Uh, but also, there are also business, and businesses don't want to pay taxes because their shareholders want to make, mon make money, so they don't want to put money back into the system. So there's always this constant tensions be tension between them. The states need the companies, and the companies really don't need the states. They do, in fact, need the states. They need roads and workers who are educated and healthcare and all kinds of things, but they pretend that they don't need the states because they are capitalists and they don't like public uh, spending. Um, but basically, their, their interest, always their short-term interest, is to pay as little taxes as possible. And when your interest is to be as invisible to a state as possible and hide your money as well as possible, of course that's what, what's going to happen. And that's why we have so many companies that uh, are beyond the control of individual states. And that's why things like the European Union is super important, because then we get the scale, states to collaborate on a scale where we can actually uh, fight back a little bit through, towards companies um, through things like regulation. Who, but I mean, but the thing is that these, these companies all have quite a lot of power. So if you want to stop climate change, for instance, we can think about like, I shouldn't be eating meat, like on the individual level, or I can think about my travel, or we can think about like, actually, that's a relatively small impact. The real impact would be things like um, changing the laws of my country so that we create financial, in financial incentives to use less energy, for instance, or drive less cars or fly, or they should be more expensive to fly. And certainly we shouldn't put state subsidies into, into, into businesses that are actively destroying the world. We're doing that in all the countries of the world right now. And that would also be very important. But even so, there are still other kinds of structures that are even beyond. I just read, um, I think it was that the 17 largest, and this was like a real number, but I think the 17 largest um, transport ships in the world, their uh, carbon dioxide emissions are equivalent to 50 million cars. And it's like, see, because getting 50 million cars off the road is really difficult. But getting 17 ships off the seas should be relatively easy. It's just the 50 million ca cars we can engage with through legislation or culture, but those 17 ships are controlled by companies where we have no direct control unless we are oligarchs who own these companies, for instance. Then we could make a change here. So you see, this is, this is actually getting really complicated now because if we want to change something in the world, we have to think about like where is the power? How do you actually make the kind of change that you're looking for? And it's all very well and fine to go and out and like make an activist piece or make an art piece to raise awareness of an issue, but raising awareness of an issue is happening somewhere here on the communication level, like at best you can change norms and values in your culture. But that has systemic effects only when those norms and value changes turn into election results. And people don't all have the same values as you do, because some people like the, in most of, of the global north right now, we're moving towards the populist right. There are people who are reactionaries and afraid of, of science and strangers. And they are currently winning elections. So it turns out that like, that's, 
it's not a very efficient way of changing the world right now, tra changing norms. It's also super important because we have to fight back. Of course, we can't just walk away. If the fascists keep winning elections, that means we have to change the culture even more. So if everything, anything all of us do for the rest of our lives is we create LARPs that make people into not fascists, or that we create LARPs that make people actually accept that science is true, then we have made a very, very positive impact in the world. And that's super important. And eventually, I think it will help us at least not lose as many elections and maybe even win some. That would be good. But that is not the same thing as, for instance, stopping climate change. Do you see that there's, there's a time scale issue here? And any kind of change that you want to make, we have to think about on what level is the problem. We have individual change, which LARP is really good at, we think, probably very good at. We have local change, local thing, issues, regional, national, transnational, and global, for instance. And the farther away you get from your physical body, the more difficult it is to make an impact, and the more humans you probably need to organize to have some kind of impact, or you need to find the, act, the right human. I don't know who owns those 17 ships, but maybe it's no more than 20 people. None of us have access to those 20 people. But if we could get those 20 people who own those 17 ships into a LARP, <laughs> I know that would have to be one hell of a LARP. <laughs> and this, this specific situation is, un is unlikely to happen. But do you see what I mean? So of course, when we say individual impact, if we mean my individual impact, it's relatively small. But I'm on hugging terms with like probably four ministers in the cover current government of Sweden. That's just like randomly happened. Sweden, everybody hugs everybody. So if you're acquainted, you're on hugging terms. But still, like of course my reach is not zero. And some like if I don't know if you are Danish, so your reach, individual reach on the Swedish political system is probably lower than mine. I'm at least a citizen in Sweden. Do you see what I mean? So who you are in any given situation, of course, that matters. But it, and, and just as an important question when you're thinking about the individual impact is, how do I get to the individual whose mind I want to change? Do not create a fucked up reality game around them, and do not kidnap them, because those things are very dangerous and illegal. <laughs> Maybe the reality game is not entirely illegal, but probably a bad idea. On the local level, you can organize people who live in your neighborhood or in your country or in your city, and you can just reach all the politicians, like you can reach all the politicians in your municipality and personally talk to them or organize the people in your building or in your neighborhood or Facebook. This is work that is relatively easy to do and that's why a lot of activism is happening on this level. And then it gets more and more complex and you need bigger and bigger organizational partners uh, as we go along. Okay, impact and effort. Um, in Sweden, the also actually in Denmark and Finland at least, and maybe also some other countries, that we have these political festivals every year in Sweden, it's called Almedal and it's in Gotland, where all the political parties and all the main politicians and all the lobby organizations and all the civil society organizations go together to Visby once a year for a week and then they talk to each other about issues and drink a lot of rosé wine. Uh, and they have a lot of seminars and everybody has to go to these seminars and it's very exhausting. And every, everybody who has anything that they want to achieve politically has to go there and give a seminar. Now, how much impact do you think it has to give a seminar in a festival with, like, let's say, 5,200 seminars? Maybe not great. So I was, I'm an experienced designer, I have a company that does this, and I was approached by a Swedish uh, labor union, one of the teacher unions, and they said, could you help us do like a really good panel discussion at Albedale? And I thought about this, and I like ran the system in my mind, like what is the power, what are they trying to achieve, who could be feasibly in the room, and then I said, uh, what is the purpose? Because of course the first design question is, what is the purpose, why are, what are you trying, why, why, why are you trying to do this, what are you trying to achieve? And they said, we need to show to our members that we are doing things, and we need to, and if we have a panel, we can invite the politicians so, so to be on the panel, and they have to come because we're a labor union, and then we can talk about our issues with the politicians on the panel. And I thought about this, and then I said, no, I can't do that because it's not going to work. I said, but everybody does it, yeah, and it doesn't work for anybody. <laughs> so when you are on a panel discussion, and you are a politician or a labor union, what is your role? What's your job on the panel? What's your social role? Defend your... Yeah, defend your views. The, defend the views of the party or your organization. So if you are on a panel discussion, is it socially possible for you to change your opinion during the conversation? No. no. You cannot change your opinion. So if your goal is to change the opinion of a politician, you cannot put them in front of an audience to defend their current opinion. 
That's just not going to work. That is impossible. And this is a simple power analysis. And then I explain this to them, and they're like, you have a point. <laughs> but everybody does say, okay, yeah, yeah, but we do this. This is our culture. Like this, this is like a kind of political dance that we do. And the people in the room might listen, and they might change their mind. But what are the odds, to be honest? It's because they're already your members, so they're, they already agree with you. So it seems like a very expensive way to do nothing. <laughs> so possibly you could take the exact same money and take those four politicians and offer them like a really exclusive e experience. Maybe you invite them to a panel and there isn't a panel and you kidnap them and they're like, we can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but like, but like, it's basically, it's like, well, why the hell you make them play a LARP? And then, and then it's like, but then we can't do it in Almedan because their time is so valuable there, they would be very upset. Yeah, so could you get those four people into a room at any other time during a year and give them a one hour, two hour, three hour experience that really makes them experience what your issues as this labor, what you're trying to, the point you're trying to make as a labor union about working in schools, for instance. Could you bring them to a school and put them in a role playing situation? And then, I mean, this project didn't happen, but they were like, that might actually be possible. Yes, it is possible. I mean, it's not possible for me. I can't get four government ministers into a school to play a LARP. But a labor union might, especially if they get all the labor unions in this field to collaborate and make this ask. And they are asking for this time and it's the job of the politicians to show up. And there's not an audience and the media isn't there. This is just to make them experience something in their body. Then suddenly the effort is very similar and the financial cost is very similar, but the impact you're getting on those four people because it's the right four people might be very high indeed. Okay? So the problem with this, of course, is that, like we said at the beginning, the four government ministers don't actually make policy. The number of people you would have to convince is probably quite a lot higher, maybe it's 400 people, and you're probably not going to get all of those to a LARP. So it, you're probably going to need to do this as part of an, uh, like a number of things that are happening in parallel in different media, in different, um, in different platforms. Um, yes, so when you're thinking about, the, if you want to change something in the world, like if you're really serious about changing it, and it's not just about I want to lift this issue or I want this culture to be nicer, or I want to create a piece of art about something that I care about, and all of those things are valid. Do those things awesome, it's much better than doing nothing. But if you want to actually change something in society, you have to make a real analysis about like where is the power. And here actually, if, if you've played like systems, mathematical sort of strategy games, or you play strategy computer games or something, you're probably actually pr really good at this. You can make these this systems, you can draw the diagram in your mind. Who decides? Which are the individuals? And if you don't know who, who any of these people are, then you should probably do some homework or ally yourself with an organization who has that knowledge. Like there are NGOs in civil society, there are, I guarantee you there are experts who understand the power structures around the issues that you are trying to affect. And if, if your first job will be to get them to trust that you can make some kind of meaningful contribution. And that's not going to be easy. Um, but if you can make them believe that you can make a meaningful contribution, that's actually probably very good because it's going to force you to listen. You're going to have to learn quite a lot about how reality works. And it sucks because reality is complicated and depressing. But it's not impossible to change. Uh, I just, uh, this is a picture by Thomas Puikonen from, I think, the first round of Halat Hisar in Finland, which was a Palestinian Finnish um, uh, project, a uh, very, very strong LARP I played with the rerun, uh, and it had an emo enormous primary impact on the participants, and you cre gave us, of course, um, an emotional understanding of the lived experience uh, of the Palestinian occupation, and it got a fair amount of, of media coverage in Finland. Uh, what the impact of this is in the world is very dependent on who the players are. I and a, a friend of mine, who is also a LARPer, uh, and now actually works for a trade union, uh, but back in the day she was a LARPer and we were working in, in uh, Swedish radio. We played Just a Little Love, which is about AIDS history, and we came home from that LARP and had a lot of thoughts and feelings about AIDS history. Of course we knew about AIDS, we grew up in that time, but we didn't understand the kinds of, of cruelty that governments had done against their own populations when it came to HIV. And we realized that it was 30 years, next year would be 30 years from from the first diagnosed case of AIDS uh, in Sweden. And we said, okay, but how about, let's make a series of radio documentaries. And we, because that was our job. So we pitched that and we made a series of radio documentaries about Swedish AIDS history and we talked to a lot of survivors and people who currently have HIV and created a platform in the public sphere for conversation about this that wouldn't have existed if that LARP hadn't been run. I think now if you go to a Pride Parade in any Nordic country, it's very likely to have a queer nerds block I think that would not have happened without just a little loving. The individuals involved in these different Nordic cities 
making these, these demonstrations in the Pride Parade and creating spaces and then creating organizations and creating social spaces where, where, where kids who are gamers and also queer can feel safe and have communities and flower in the context of their hobby. That also probably wouldn't have happened without Just a Little Loving. So you see, these impacts are real. Like There are real effects on people's lives in the world that happen from these LARPs. But, but probably not systemic effects. This uh, is from a LARP series called Baltic Warriors, uh, which was uh, designed by um, Johanna Pettersson and uh, Mike Pohjola. And this was part of, a, in 2015, I think, and it was part of a bro broader transmedia project run out for a German film company. There was a documentary film and some other things. You can read about it on balticwarriors.net. And this was about environmental problems in the Baltic Sea, which is not a sexy topic. And they designed a LARP where, it, because in the, in the, bottom, the bottom of the Baltic Sea is dead, there are these called so-called dead zones where nothing can grow. It uh, has to do with chemistry. I'm not going to explain it because I can't remember the exact dynamic. But anyway, they created a LARP where, which, where, which was this. We are having a political conversation in this LARP about the situation in the Baltic Sea and how do we like, affect it. There are lobbyists and there are politicians. And then the Viking zombies attack <laughs> from the dead zone of the Baltic Sea. And through uh, here you can see what's happening in this picture is that if you can carry the clean water and you can fight the zombies with the clean water. <laughs> and it was funny, but the political content, the debate part of the LARP was very serious and the zombie fighting part was very fun. And it was a very low threshold LARP to participate in because it's set in the now, you don't need to have a special costume and so on. And this LARP went on tour, it was in seven cities around the Baltic. And in every city they created this real political debate as part of the LARP where some real politicians and lobbyists and someone showed up and then some LARPers and some random people. Now, and then this was of course interesting for the media because if you can get a picture of a politician and a zombie, <laughs> that's very interesting. Secondary reach, very good. Because people are like, what the fuck? And then you can explain, and also the Baltic Sea is suffering. So in all its simplicity, this is actually a really good thing. But the one thing that really struck me with this particular project and its impact is that when they were casting these people, they didn't get to play themselves. So you would have a lobbyist playing a politician and a politician playing a lobbyist. Of course they know what the other person would say. They've been on that panel a thousand times, right? But when you are forced to say with your mouth the arguments of the opposing side, it changes how you think about those arguments in both directions. This, like, the outcome of this is not clear, but at least the next time they go in and have that conversation, they will meet each other with some empathy and some humanity because when you say those things, you're like, yes, yes, the thing that you always say, you have heard your own mouth say those words, words. And I think that that may actually have had, and of course there's no way to measure this, but I think that that may have had some real impact again. The right people playing other roles forced to empathize with somebody else's situation. Okay. When we make LARPs, broadly speaking, if you want to make like a really good LARP, the only thing you need to do is to answer these questions. What do I want my participants to feel? Hello, checking for updates, let's see, just a moment, yes, that was, uh, yep. What do I want my participants to feel? This is your why, basically, well, why, why the hell am I even making this LARP? The second version of that is how do I want my participants to change? And this is actually like a sneaky way of saying, usually what, what we would use, another word we would say, what do I want my participants to experience? But I use this word instead to remind you that an experience is changing somebody. An experience is something that has a beginning and a middle and an end, and in the, in the middle something changes. This is also how a story is structured. That's why LARPs feel like stories. When we come through them, sometimes LARPs also have stories, but whether they do or not, it always feels like a story after the fact. And if the thing that changes is a human, then it's an experience. Okay. How do I want my participants to change? And now you know what you're trying to do with your LARP, and then you have to ask yourself, the only important question in art design, if we want to be super crass, which is what kinds of activities should my participants be doing? This is, in fact, also the key question in any kind of experience design that you might ever want to do in your life. If you want to organize a party, exact same question. What kinds of activities will my, should my participants be doing? And if the kind of experience you're making is a LARP, then you should also ask yourself the follow-up question, how are those activities connected to the theme of the LARP? And if you can answer all of these questions, then you can, then you can, then designing the actual LARP is relatively easy. Like, okay, I want them to dance and negotiate and fight zombies. I don't know why this would be the verbs, but that's what I want because of, that's how I want to make them feel. I want to make them feel something and to make them feel something, I need them to do these things. How do I make them do those things? Well, that's LARP design. 
I put in some story and situation and characters and world and mechanics and perhaps a set and perhaps some costumes and we do some things before and I communicate in a specific way and I select the participants in a certain way and so on and then all of that is, the, is just a machine that it has the intention of making them do all of these things. And then if the, if the activities that they do are connected to the theme of the LARP, they will feel the theme of the LARP in their bones, in their body, and the thing that changes them, with, through their own actions, they will be changed, or they will have an experience, and that's a good LARP. That's what it is, basically. I know this is a little trivial, but you understand how to actually do the LARP, so let's, you just got this schematic now. But again, we have to talk, think about the time scale of the problems that we're trying to, trying to resolve here. So if the problem that you're trying to resolve is um, climate change, the likelihood that two billion people will die in your lifetime. I, I think we might be fucked on the two billion people. Like, that might actually happen anyway. But if we don't want that number to be higher, then there are some things that need to happen on a grand systems level in the world in the next 10 years. And in a 10-year time scale, making a law takes quite a lot of time. Like, you need to affect people very fast. And then maybe making, like, LARPs and changing people's worldview might not be efficient enough. If you want to change something on that time scale within 10 years, you might need to get the, some real stakeholders into your LARP within the next three years maximum. But it might be possible. It just depends on who your allies are. It depends on who you're working with. Like, if that's what you want to do, I'm not saying that it's impossible, but it's, let's keep that in mind. If what you want to change is um, structural racism in Europe, then it's okay that it takes a little longer. You see what I mean? Then, then it's not like we're not all going to die if we don't. If some people are going to die, and that really sucks. Like, this is life and death issues for a lot of people. But we might be able to change the systems through changing norms and values in a slower way through art. Okay. Um, I have a whole Nordic LARP talk that you should look up that is basically about this diagram. Uh, if you just go on Nordic LARP talks and search for my name, you can find it there. But I'm talking about how in LARP design the, we have a lot of focus on designing the runtime, which is what is happening while people are playing characters. And we're really good at that. But we have to remember that what happens here is very much a product of what happens before, how we communicate with the players, how we workshop and so on. You know all of this. But we often forget is that what happens after the runtime, after we have played the characters, that's of course where, where we negotiate what was this experience, what did it mean, and so on. And in this talk I talk more in detail about how to think about this. But I think if you want to create real change in the world, if you want to take that individual experience and turn it into action, that happens here, that happens after the characters have been played. And you have a real moment of opportunity on the sort of liminal border, at the edge of the magic circle, when people have just come out of the LARP, but before they have landed in their real life, the choices that you make there will affect, of course, what they do next. So when I said the word normal que design question in LARP, when we make LARP just, just for entertainment or art purposes, we ask, what do I want my participants... Hello? What do I want my participants to feel? This is the time for this to die. I was just coming to my point. Sorry. Normally we ask, what do I want my participants to feel? Yeah, I'm sorry. It looks right here. They don't want us to know. No, they don't want to know the answer. What instead I think you should ask yourself if you want to use LARP to create real change in the world. This is very simple, but it's this question instead. What do I want my participants to do? Which is weird, because that's the heart of LARP design. In the LARP, during the LARP, we ask all the time, we ask, what do I want them to do? But in this, if we want to LARP for change, right, we also have to ask what do I want them to do after the LARP. But you know what you're really good at? Making people do stuff. <laughs> so if you want to design the part after the LARP to what they're going to do then, so that they do something that, happened, that has an effect in the world, you can totally do that. And I, unfortunately, I, I realized this yesterday at lunch, so I don't have the answers in detail yet. But it might be that the kind of LARP you make, the shape of the LARP might be different if you want them to do some things afterwards. Maybe you don't want to give them the super satisfying conclusion, for instance. Maybe you want to leave an open state that can only be emotionally resolved through action in the real world, for instance. Possibly. This is the first idea that comes to my mind. That might be a shit LARP experience, and then it might not be a good idea. I'm, I'm not sure. The other thing is, remember, you, don't, you can't lie to your players about what you're trying to do. The bait and switch, that, that, uh, the gotcha rhetoric, 
that's not that doesn't work very well that Eric was talking about yesterday. So you need to be transparent about this, but that doesn't matter because it's still going to work. Okay. So let's not delude ourselves when we want to use LARP to change the, the world. Let's think about what is LARP really good at. And LARP is really good at making people do things. And actually, sometimes, very often, I think, if you're solving, trying to solve an urgent problem, maybe don't make a LARP. Just use all of the things that you have learned from making LARPs to create the best meeting and the best analysis of a power structure and the best behavior and the best activism or the best social movement. If what you need is a social movement, if you, if you want to change a law, you probably don't have time to make a LARP about changing the law. You should use the same ideas and dynamics for how to make people do stuff and use those powers for good. But, and if you want to use power, use LARP to change people, you figure out who are in power. And there are two ways of doing this. Either you get the people who currently have power and put them in your LARP as players, or you take the people who are currently your players and you make them run for office. I'm not even joking. Like, this might actually be easier. And by run for office, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's civil society. Maybe you organize them as activists or so on. But somewhere there needs to be a connection between the individuals and the decisions. And that is all. Thank you very much.